Hello, I'm Laura Furiosi, divorce mother of three, and I'm here with my mother, Lynette Galvin, with 35 years' experience in family law. You're listening to the Divorce Course Podcast. Through our candid discussions, we hope to help you through your divorce or de facto separation. We will be answering the most commonly asked questions and covering the stages and steps that you will face on your way to freedom. There's a lot of posts on the internet about coercive control, but there's not much on there about coercive control after separation. So today we're going to be talking about the 12 signs of coercive control that are bandied around on the internet and how they apply to you perhaps after separation. And also at the end, so it's not all doom and gloom, we're going to talk about five things that you can do to help undo some of the damage. Remembering though, this may be triggering to those who have experienced any sort of family violence or domestic violence. If you do need help, please call 1-800-RESPECT or if you are in immediate danger, please call triple zero. Hello, (laughs) mum. Hello, Laura. Hello, everyone. So, mum, I've noticed on line, there are heaps of posts saying 12 signs of coercive control, coercive control, this, this, this is what out mm. to look for, which may be helpful to some people, but incredibly not helpful to those who are separated mm. because it's not as clear. I think it's kind of, they go gaslighting and this and that and this, mm. but there's no, it's not put into, into context of separation, it's, which, which, yeah. you know, falls into that post-separation that's right. abuse. Yeah, that's right. And it, it's, it's always been very clear clear to everyone, and I think this is why it was the first sort of domestic violence identified, was if you've been hit, if you've been pushed, if, you know, physical harm. Mm. And that was clear cut. Yes. And years and years ago, I've heard the police say, where are the bruises? Yes. So this sort of control is very dangerous because it does happen after separation as well. Mm. And uh, and it can lead to really serious consequences for the people who try to escape that coercive control relationship. Yes. Recently, we had a meeting with the Queensland Police, head of the Domestic Violence, Family Violence and Vulnerable Persons Unit, and I had a chat with her about the new criminal law coercive control affirmative consent amendment bill that 2023, which in state law, in, yeah, in state law in Queensland, and there are some concerns around that that I want to talk about as well, where mm. the the wording can perhaps sometimes, if if someone is being pushed through legal abuse and post separation abuse, mm-hmm. there is a danger that I feel that can it can be flipped the other way, and they can accuse you of coercive control. Mm. So we need to really highlight to everybody that, yes, if there's great, there's laws coming in around the world. You know, the UK, I know, has them. You know, America's got a bill that mentions it. But there is there is these protective place strategies in place. But if you're up against someone who is using the legal system against you in every possible <sighs> way, mm. this can be a new way to a new tool for those legal abusive yeah. abusers to use against you. So it is also a good idea when we're going through this to keep that in mind that yeah. that you don't fall into the trap of being used used against you. Yes, yes, because uh, you know coercive control uh, is a pattern of behaviour. Mm. Coercive control is a series of things that might not seem of themselves to be particularly serious. So you report them to the police and they go, seriously? Are you seriously reporting this to me? But unless the police record it, Mm. um, and, you you know, our listeners know to get their badge number, get their full name, if they won't take a statement from you. Because if you don't record those little things, the court can't see the pattern. And you get in the witness box and the judge... uh, Barrister on the other side goes, well, did you report it? Oh, well, I tried to, oh, I see, well, there's nothing in the police reports. It's kind of been very serious. And that, and that is the fail-safe system that the family court has, isn't it, is mm. they check police reports to see if there's they, anything that's been reported. They check child, child services safety. Yep. and safety to see if anything's been reported. And if nothing's been reported, it's very hard for you to say, well, no, it, it did happen. I just didn't go yes. through with it. So it, it's a disconnect between the state systems in Australia and the family court, which is a federal system. That's right. Very good, Laura. <laughs> Look at me using my year seven. <laughs> so, so working on this recognition, and, and to be honest, the court hasn't always been able to recognise this pattern, hmm. and it often doesn't become apparent until the trial when you've got the abuser okay. in the witness box and, and then you can put these series of actions to them which accumulate 
accumulatively coercive control, but it might be things as simple as only letting you use one knife in the kitchen, particular knife, or checking the miles, the kilometres that you've driven mm. on a day, you know, in the car, or constant. Well, we talk about those yes. things, but it, but it, little things like that don't really catch the the, the police's imagination. And or they don't the judges. Go, oh, my goodness, yeah. let's go get him. He's been checking the mileage on the car. Mm. But actually, in, co- in conjunction with everything else, it's a very dangerous pattern. And I think the biggest issue is that the victim doesn't really realise it. And I think that's the one thing that we're going to talk about at the end, mm. what you can do to help undo some of this damage once you finally get free of it. And it's a realisation that slowly comes to people as they get out of it. I guess it's like if you came out of a, a country that had very strict laws and it was very restrictive and you come to a different country where the laws are free and, and you realise, oh, wow, wow. Yes. Well, I didn't know you could do that. I it's didn't know you were allowed to do that. Yes, it's kind of, well, excuse me. Yeah. How come he's been bossing me around or she's been bossing yes. me around for 15 years and I'm actually able to make my own decision? So let's get into the 12 signs that, that we see everywhere on the internet, which is great because people need to see it, but I think we need to go into depth. Mm. You know, So people might not realise that they're experiencing coercive control until after they leave. Yeah. And that coercive control may change slightly, but it can still continue mm. after the fact. So let's talk about, number one, isolating you from your support system. So straight off the bat after separation, mum, most people in a normal separation, what's amicable and and both people are mentally well and respectful, you would go to your mum, your dad, your brother, your sister, your besties, your family friends and and say, oh, we're breaking up. I'm, I'm really heartbroken. Can you give me some support? Let's yeah. talk about this. Can I cry on your shoulder? Can you make me some dinner because I'm not going to eat for a week? Yeah. Or you might choose to not share mm. it with anybody and that's your prerogative yes. as well. Yes. But what happens is... When it's coercive control in a relationship, it's not letting you go out to that birthday party. It's not letting you go to that dinner. It's telling you you have to stay home and making you think your family doesn't like you. Or putting putting conditions on going out yes. and talking to people. But but in a in a separation situation, how is it, Mum, that they isolate you from your support system? Well, the, the, they they run. They, they don't walk. They run to your family members, your close friends, and try to set up the narrative of poor me. He, she's gone mad. She doesn't know what she's doing. I need your help. We need to keep our marriage together. I don't know what's wrong with her. I haven't done anything. That sort of thing. And they quite try to enlist family members so that when you finally get to tell them, even if you go like an hour or two afterwards, you'll often find they've already been there. Mm. So when you start to say things to them, they're seeing it through the lens of your abuser and they and remembering if you're in a coercive control relationship you've never talked about this stuff to your parents or you, you, you keep it all together because you want the marriage to last you might not even recognize the control well, you don't want your family and friends to hate them. If you told them while you were together what they were doing, that some of these ladies would know that their, their family would say, get away from them. Yeah, Why are you giving them a second right. chance? So it's kind of like the final nail in it. Mm. So, yes. So, so, so when it comes to isolation from your support system, that can also mean your legal support, can't it? Mm, it have, can. you, have you seen any coercive control tactics about getting uh, people away from lawyers? Oh, yes. The old, let's not get the lawyers involved. Your lawyer doesn't know what they're talking about. My lawyer is more qualified than your lawyer. Or if you go to a lawyer, it's going to cost us so much money. It's not it's fair. The- Don't be selfish. They're, they're coercing mm-hmm. you to not go and find out what's fair. We, yeah, we, need, we need the money for the kids. I'll tell you what's right. I've, I know what's going to happen. And you go, oh, okay, mm-hmm. because this person's probably managed the finances all the way through. Or so if... Or uh, one of the other ones I've heard a lot from our members, if you go see a lawyer, it means war. Yep, that's it. And so you you be afraid to go and see a lawyer because you're worried that you are going to start a fight and it's going to be and it'll feel like your fault because you went to see a lawyer. But you need to understand that going and seeing a lawyer and getting legal support during the separation is not doesn't mean war. It just means the same reason why you would go to a financial planner to invest money. The same reason you go to an accountant to do your tax or a doctor to investigate something. Some medical wrong with issue. You. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's your right to know mm-hmm. and and. If you don't go and get a lawyer, I reckon nine times out of ten, you're the only one not represented. X will have been to a lawyer and if they say that you don't need to go, 
chances are they don't like what they were told. They don't Mm. like the percentage you're likely to get and will try to minimise it. And keeping you away from a lawyer stops you finding out your true entitlement. So don't go into that. Don't buy into that, guys. There's one other way I think I've seen recently from members isolating them from their legal support Mm. is going in and instead of communicating to their lawyer, lawyer to lawyer, or, you know, if they don't have a lawyer communicating to your lawyer, they'll write the letters to you instead and and by, try and bypass the lawyer yeah. altogether in the hope that somehow they'll be able to press that button that they used to press in the relationship to get you to do what they want. Yes. Yes. Like a little robot. Now, we could talk all day about isolating you from yeah. support systems because but that's, drift. But that's also, and, you know, psychologists, if you, they might try and go and speak to your psychologist, mm-hmm. family marriage counsellors. Yep. And your best friends, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. or they might recruit. Like when you had friends as a couple, they will try to get those friends on their team. Mm -hmm. So at the end, we're going to talk about how to make sure you've got that support system. And I want you now to have a think about it if you're listening right now. What support systems do you have in place? How can you protect them moving forward from accidentally being coerced back into losing those people and being isolated from them? How are you going to protect your boundaries with your support system? Because when it comes down to it, going through a divorce or a separation, particularly when there is coercive control and post-separation abuse, you need that support system. Yeah, you will. You okay. definitely do. So number two, mum, monitoring your activities. So stalking. Stalking. And it's uh, so easy online now. Oh, it's it, it's uh, kind of commonplace in a way. Yeah. So but commonplace. It's irky. But there's a difference between going to see what your ex-boyfriend did and their new girlfriend just to see who they are as opposed to watching where they are at what time and so we had an example written into us recently one of the examples we provided to the police headquarters where the ex would text the person everything they did that day in and retrospect so at the so end of the you day you went to the Woolworths you oh. bought the groceries you then walked to the shop you then went and picked up the children your partner then picked up the other <gasps> child and then you got home at this time so in itself it doesn't seem like a really bad I drastic it's dangerous stalking. thing but but it is it's intimidation yes. to say, I'm watching you. I'm watching everything you do. Yes. I think I like to think that would result in a, an order. You'd like order to again. think that when you... But then how do you stop it, Laura? Because what are they using? Are they putting like an apple tag on, you know, the ones you put in your mm-hmm. suitcase? So we did overseas. hear that. Yeah. There's also something I've just been made aware of through another uh podcast where in your Apple phone, there is a setting for, you know, impaired, Find my phone? My no, phone? and impaired people. It, you know how you get something to read it to you? Yes. There's also an option for your phone to hear. So you can oh then you can then attach it to your, so if you're hearing impaired, you can get headphones yes. and use your phone to amplify what people are saying. So you can hear them in your phone, but people are now using that. It has been discovered the hearing impaired option in your Apple phone to then send the phone off and then listen through your headphones. So make sure when your kids get home, if you've got a coercive control person or a person who's stalking you, you check that hearing setting mm. and make sure it's not connected to any devices. Oh, that's that's spooky. That's yeah, weird. It's good for dis, uh, uh, people who have impaired hearing, but it's not great for people who are going through a separation. Never ceases to amaze me. I know. That but there's all these do. new things that happen yes. on phones all the time and, and it's very tricky. Yep. And, you know, you've probably got family sharing. Mm-hmm. on your Apple ID or whatever, and that's all of you. Yes. Um, the banking may be visible to both of you, so there are people who the other side knows when you've taken the money out or when you've paid something at that at that Coles, where she went, you mm-hmm. know, and mm-hmm. then where she had a coffee, and they may have only been imagining the, contribu- the bits in between, but it sounds a bit spooky. Mm-hmm. So also another way that people can track you is if you share an Uber account. Yes. Yep. Even Uber Eats. Or your just, flybys. So we're not trying oh, to scare you, but what no. we're trying to say is that uh, monitoring your movements may have happened while you were together, but it can continue afterwards. Now, Mum, what can can that be helpful what part of that can they use to provide to the police or to a lawyer or to the court? Well, that text that the lady got mm-hmm. about what time she did the groceries, who picked up the kids, that's really strong evidence to take to the police. Okay. Uh, if you find, I mean, you need to get, I think, sometimes go in and get a specialist. TV places do. Helpers in each state, I think, will go through your phone and make sure there's nothing been planted on it, no spyware on it or anything like that. So I think it's that, important for everyone to also realise that, yes, you can be stalked on social media. So little things that you can do is, and, and people have written in and said, I hate having to hold back because I know my ex 
Netflix is watching. If you are someone who likes to post things mm. and you have blocked them, but they're still somehow seeing it, always post where you've been after the fact. Yes. Or don't post where you are at all. If it is really bad, just hold just back for a little while. Try not to, yeah. Try not to and, and just be aware that there's been so many videos where someone's taken a photo and all you can really see is trees in the background, but mm. people can find out your location very easily from all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, too, the police are reluctant. If there's anything happens with Facebook and you go into the police station with Facebook and say they've known this, if your setting is set to public, then there's nothing they can do. You may have to change your way of thinking. And remembering, even if you're just posting to people you think are family and friends, it's out there Mm -hmm. and it may be used against you. So, yeah. Yeah, so definitely hold back if you can on social media. It's hard anyway because you're not supposed to be talking about proceedings online. So you do have to hold back all that. So maybe have a break from it, Mm. go and do a digital detox, give yourself a break. So we're going on to number three and it's denying your freedom and autonomy. And then whilst you're in a relationship, you know, your freedom, your autonomy could be, you you know, not allowed to join a group, not allowed to go to a particular event, really only being able to leave when you're you're with them, not even being able to choose what haircut to get and what hair colour, what clothes to wear. But what does denying your freedom and autonomy look like in a post-separation abuse world, Mum? Well, if you've been trained to kind of listen and do what they say, they will act as though they still have that right. Mm. It's like, you know, do not go to the the exhibition with the the kids. I don't approve. Do not let them uh, see your new boyfriend. Do not go to your mother's. Don't go on a holiday to to interstate because I don't agree. That's right. Don't have a new boyfriend at all. So a lot of that denying your freedom and autonomy can come from after separation, from having a mindset that you're still in that relationship. Yep. But moving on. And and there's so much on the internet. And and I know these people are coming from a great place where they're saying co-parenting, do this for your children, don't fight with, you know, keep at the peace so that your children have a better life. You can do this. And people feel guilty going, well, I would like to stand up for myself and say to them, no, I do want to take my children to my mother's house or no, I do want to go to take, let them do this play or something like that. So, so people I think, are trapped in this world of wanting to look like they're being a Mm. good co-parent and wanting to be a good co-parent for the sake of the children. And the the coercive partner is using that to keep you in their control. That's exactly right. Or the coercive partner may actually withhold financial support Mm. if you do something they don't agree with. And we will get into that shortly. But yes, that denying you your freedom and autonomy is really a big one. That that includes saying, well, we've always had, always done this together, so we should still do it together for the sake of the children. You need to set yourself free from these people. If they've been coercive controlling, it doesn't end at separation. No, especially separation under one roof. Yes. Oh, yes. And we've we've got a whole episode, three episodes on separation under one roof. But if you are separated under one roof with a coercive controlling person, setting those boundaries and, and setting your own habits, timelines, living space. If you're desperate and you can't get out, you need to do that. You need to set a whole new way of living to just show yourself and then that it's new. And and I can say from experience that it is a wonderful feeling when you suddenly realise you can make these choices for yourself. Mm, and, mm. and it infuriates the coercive control person, but the there's not much they can do about it. And I think, yeah, just making that, making that realisation, oh, mm. I can do stuff. Mm. Anybody going through separation has that realisation, whether it's been coercive some controlling point. or not. What What are you going to watch on mm. TV tonight? You don't need to ask anybody else. That's right. What are you going to eat for dinner? Apart from the kids, you don't need to ask anybody else. So there is this new whole world of freedom and, and it is it comes at you like a head rush if it you does. can get yourself out of that Yeah, because a lot of the coercive control post-separation is is in your head in a way. It's in your reactions to that. That's where their power lies, in reaction to what they say. And they've been able to say this all through the marriage. You've been conditioned to respond. The telltale sign when I have someone I'm talking to and they go, he won't let me. Yes. Or my wife doesn't let me. And we are all over 18. (laughs) Hopefully. Hopefully. We're over 18. You ha- you know, the only people who cannot let you do something are the authorities. Mm. To be honest, you know, you have all the freedom of anyone else. So when it comes to that, be aware that you are 
coming out of a coercive control relationship, Mm. you are going into this new place. Now that freedom, feel a little stuck in the post-separation abuse world if you get stuck in the legal system. Because I know a lot of people, they say, I'll feel so much better once this is all done. But in the reality, if you're in a post-separation abuse relationship, it's going to take a few years to fully untangle. Like, so mum, you used to describe it as an octopus on your hand and you're pulling one suction bit off at a time on eight of those legs. So you've got to get your mindset into, yes, I'm not fully free yet. No. But I will be and I have some freedom. Yes. And, and you know, your dream and your wish will ultimately be to be free and not afraid of your freedom because if you haven't had it for a while, you can flounder a little bit. Mm-hmm. But the coercive controlling person's worst nightmare is that you are free and can do what you want. So everything that the court is doing, which is wonderful about early intervention, getting guys into mediation and so forth, I think is highlighting that you might go in with the best will in the world. But if the person on the other side is going into mediation knowing or thinking that if they settle, they lose their control over you, they start all sorts of shenanigans and don't negotiate with an honest and open heart. Mm. And it's devastating, particularly now in the world of paid mediations, where you're probably paying half, you're paying a lawyer maybe, and you they'll turn up sometimes with a barrister and a solicitor and themselves or just them and their lawyers, and you think you're getting somewhere and, and then nah. Because Mm. they're not being honest about their goal. Their goal is not to get to the end and get you out. They they are the octopus. I read a a title the other day, which was really great, and it's it's not a high conflict divorce. It's a post separation legal abuse relationship. Oh wow! Because I think it's identified by a lot of the legal system and all the professionals as, oh, this is high conflict because it's been going on for ages. But when really it's probably a legal abuse system. That's post-separation abuse. And, and, you know, the judges, you hear them all the time going, oh, it's the two of you. Yes. Those those two will never agree to anything. Or, you know, you people have been in this court system, why can't you settle? And I guess they have to direct the spray equally at you both. Mm. But if they recognise it for what it was, Mm. um, I have a dream that maybe in 15 years' time they're not allowed to drag it out. They mm. they don't have those legal avenues. Yes. And then you have a freedom that comes a lot quicker. Yes. Now let's get into gaslighting, which is the next sign mm. of coercive control, because we're not a psychologist. Mm-hmm. I found a, a definition of gaslighting and then what are some examples so you can tell if you are being gaslighted. Have you been separated under one roof or are you about to leave your partner? Please go and download our free before you go checklist. A list of things that have been created by Lynn Galvin, a family lawyer specialist of 35 years. All the things she wished her clients had collected before they'd left. Save yourself a lot of money, subpoena heartache and drama and disclosure issues by doing this checklist before you go. If say, so, go to WT www.thedivorcecourse.com.au and click on Before You Go Checklist. So gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation in which the abuser attempts to sow self-doubt and confusion in their victim's mind. Typically, gaslighters are seeking to gain power and control over the other person by distorting the reality and forcing them to question their own judgment and intuition. So signs that you're being gaslighted. So you've probably been gaslighted if you're listening to this. Gaslit. (laughs) Gaslit in your relationship during. These are some of the telltale signs that you've been gaslit. Lying about or denying something and refusing to admit the lie when you show them proof. When you know it's a lie, yeah. So that can happen a lot in the court system, Mm -hmm. can't it? And the only way around it, if you go, he he says, she says, is to get some documentary evidence if you Mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. But thank God for text messages. But even when you show them the proof. Oh, they, they, yeah, deflect. And so does deny. the judge recognise that? Oh, yes. In the end of the day, the judge, that's what works. It's documentation that works, mm. documents that work. Um, so sometimes these people, the coercive controlling types, don't get fully exposed until they're under cross examination in the trial. Mm. Meantime, you can feel like you've been through. Hell. Uh, another sign of being gaslit is insisting that an event or behaviour you witness never happened. Yes. And that you remembering that you're remembering it wrong. So that is something that is why documentation after separation yes. is so important. And we've got an episode called Documenting mm-hmm. that I'll put in the show notes for you to have a look at. If you can't find it, just send us a DM on socials or email us at the divorce course podcast at gmail.com. But yeah, tell us about documenting and why it's important, Mum. Well, it is important because it does come down to one of your word against theirs. If they're painting you as an alienator, say, for the kids, you need to have 
uh, their uh, emails ready, their texts printed out, attached to the but your barrister ne- needs to cross-examine them on these points. And like I said, they only get the comeuppance usually in the final trial. Mm. Another form of it is um, gaslighting kids, which mm. I think is despicable. Mm. So the kids don't believe the evidence of their own eyes. Yeah, yeah. and that can really cause some emotional mm. damage in the future. So, Mum, one of the ones that I've seen mentioned a lot is this is the Newport Institute that mm. has given these examples, changing the subject or refusing to listen when confronted about a lie. And I think that's something you always talk about in in controlling the narrative. Yes. So if, if your lawyer sends a letter to their lawyer saying, mm. could you explain why this happened yep. on the weekend. Kind of, what the hell? What 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 is what is this? What we, did you do? The, the yep. child has told us this occurred or yep. that this has happened to our client. Can you explain it? And then they gaslight by sending Going, a letter back talking about something completely that's different. That's right. They go, um, our client instructs your client was particularly aggressive on the weekend, but not answering yours. Now, the way that I deal with that mm-hmm. is write a letter to the other side and either have just one topic in it, one question, one topic, and then when they write back, you can say, yes, but please answer my letter of this date. And then you've got a paper trail of you've asked the question, mm-hmm. you've asked the question again, they still haven't responded, and that that is a submission you can make. There's been no satisfactory explanation of this event, so it must have been what the kids said. But typically what they say is, Oh, the child's a liar. And then it all comes out in the family report. Right. So that's so your there catch is, there. That's your catch. It's a big thing to say, but by and large, the uh, coercive controlling people, even though it wasn't really recognised mm. in the past, generally come undone in their unreasonable behaviour towards the kids mm-hmm. and to, and towards their obligations with the court, so they're normally with disclosure and stuff. But it's a long time to wait. So you have to have the mindset that you're free already yeah. and that any of these texts and emails and messages they send are all grist for the mill. Keep them, record them, mm. date them, print them out and have them ready to go in your affidavit or to give to your barrister to put to them in the court. We're, we're not going to go too much into gaslighting anymore because we've no. got so many to cover. Okay. But I did want to say there was one one other that said that Newport Institute said telling you that you're overreacting when you call them out and I think that's a really important if you have you know maybe they've done something to you after separation or you're pointing out to them what they were doing the course of control that was occurring during yep. through a lawyer letter or through your affidavits yep. uh, if they tell you that you're overreacting Yes. And if that's what they used to tell you, yes. it's really hard, I think, for some people to change their mindset from that old, like you've probably been married for 5, 10, 15 years. Absolutely. So when they say you're overreacting, it may make you second guess yourself. Yes. And you need to go reality check that with someone. Yep. Absolutely. And your response should be, you don't get to tell me how I feel. Ooh, that has you. been very powerful. You don't get to tell me how I feel. Mm. Or that, think it. You don't have to say it to them. The, if it's not safe. Yes. Yeah, but you can think it. So, I, can And it. I think it getting yourself yeah. out of this coercive control relationship isn't a physical thing as much as it is a mental thing. That's right. Because unless you're at risk and remembering these sorts of things, people Mm. are the people who kill. Mm. So you've got to be safe, Mm. right? If it was really bad, you've got to be safe. But And please call 1-800-RESPECT.000 if you need help or if you're in danger. But the the power they've got over you, apart from the financial power if they're doing that, is mostly a bullying and a pattern, learned pattern in your behaviour. So you might not be able able to change them, but gradually you can change how you react react to them. You've got to remember if you're abused uh, that you lived with for years it has behaved in a certain pattern and has always gone what they want through that pattern, of course they're going to continue that pattern after separation. So it may look slightly different, but it'll be there if if mm. if that's what was happening. So you need to be mindful of, yes, yeah, so they're not stopping you from going out and doing what you want now, but they might be trying to stop you going out and doing what you want by sending Guilt. you messages, guilting you, mm. painting a narrative that in that makes you in your head not want to go out. So you've got to be aware of all of these kind of situations. Mm. Now, Mum, there is no way we're going to get through these 12. So I'm going to do the last two, uh, two, and then we're going to have to do a two-part two-part episode. So let's do number five, name calling and putting you down. So that's a no-brainer. That would have happened during and definitely will happen after. Yes, I do remember a memorable occasion Mm. where someone had 
changed the name of their ex-partner to the old cow. Oh. And they attached, as I've instructed you guys to do, like take a photocopy of your screen, Mm -hmm. screenshot it and attach it to the affidavit. Unfortunately, they thought they were just attaching the context of the message. But this awful person had called my client the old cow (gasps) and uh, we didn't say anything. Barrister got them in the witness box and said, so who's the old cow? (laughs) And it just showed a lot of disrespect Mm. towards the mother of their children. Mm. Mm. And name calling in any regard regard. is bad. Absolutely. So don't do it yourself. Don't allow your kids to do it and definitely don't allow your ex to call you anything. Labels. Don't give them, don't do the unfit mother. Yeah. Don't let well, those labels and don't right. you use the phrase Disney dad or any like just be respectful if you can. I've heard sperm donor. Oh my gosh. So I think it's really, really important when it comes to that because they go, oh, name calling. But what they're doing is they're giving you a label that puts your mindset back in that hole. So mm. if they start saying you're an unfit mother, mm. you know, you might start thinking, oh, I'm a really bad person because I'm not being the best I can be. Because I just yelled at the kids to empty the dishwasher because I'm stressed. Oh, my gosh, I'm an unfit mother. Mm. So I want everyone to hear this. There is no such thing. As an unfit mother. As an unfit mother in Australian law. Yes, but it is something that's been dragged over for centuries. But there's no such thing as an unfit dad, but there's always mention of an unfit mother. So just be mindful that labels and names can psychologically affect you. So when they're calling you a name, have a look at it and go, why are they calling me this name? What are they trying to achieve? Yes, and, and then thwart them. And then and then sit thwart down. Them. And one of the best practices I've heard is if they're calling you an unfit mum in one way or another, you're a bad mother, mm-hmm. you're a this because you've got a boyfriend, or you're a bad mother because you let them go to a party, or you're a bad mother because you fed them McDonald's for two nights in a week. Write down everything that you know makes you a good mother. And if you can't think of anything yourself, go and ask your friends, yes. what makes me a good mother? What have you seen? And write it down and gather that evidence. So whenever they start putting that label on you, go and read that. And it might not be unfit mother. It might be that you're lazy. Yes. You're lazy because you don't have a job because you've been the stay at home mum. Or you don't know how to run your business. It wouldn't have been a business if I wasn't there to help yeah, you. Yeah. So go and talk to people. What have you seen in me that makes you think that I'm not lazy? What has you seen in that makes you think I'm a good business person? And write it down and re brain because it's brainwashing yeah re-brain wash yourself <laughs> and it could also be projection yes that's remember true. <laughs> remember they turn it back on you that's true and so it might be they think they're not very good yes at parenting and they think they're lazy so to get your freedom from that name calling yes you can document it and show it in your affidavits tell the court about it but that name calling is specifically targeted to you. Yes. There may be a name that they call you that seems completely and utterly innocent, Mm. but to you, it's some in-joke that he used to have or she used to have in your marriage that devastates you. So sit down and write, why are they saying this to me? What are they trying to achieve? And then go and gather evidence from your friends and write it down and stick it up on your wall where the kids can't see it to remind yourself. (laughs) And now number six, mum, threatening your children or your pets, which is very triggering, I'm sure, for a lot of people. And during the relationship, that can be, you know, something that happens Mm. a lot. But after the relationship, Mm. that threatening your children or pets in the legal system can be, I'm going to ask for 100% custody. Yes. I'm going to get the children taken off you. Yep. We're going to court tomorrow and the judge is going to decide what happens to you. And what do you think happens to that poor kid Mm. to spend the day in detention for playing out? Mm. Uh, So yes. So uh, the children, if they use the children that way, by telling them so they can ask you, Mummy, mm. why are we? What, what did Daddy the said, or Mummy said, we're going to live with him forever. Yes. And never see you again. Daddy said, bring all our clothes this time because we're not coming back. Mm-hmm. That sort of so thing. What can, so, what abusive. can people do about that, Mum? Well, it's really hard because if you try to counter those comments, you're also kind of putting the kids in the middle of it. Mm. So you just have to be, first, be impervious to it. Just don't let that affect oh, you. Oh, that sounds super easy to do. I'm so sorry. I know. Be impervious to the fact that someone's told you you're not going to see your children. You're not going to sleep for two nights, let's face it. Mum, the number one thing before you even start, you need to tell everybody right now that your axe murderer situation, you say the court won't take your kids off you, usually unless unless you're some kind of axe murderer. It's that kind of, there's two elements. There's the long-term 
uh, parenting, which mm-hmm. is parental responsibility. It could be equal shared or sole parental responsibility. Those mm-hmm. are the options. Mm-hmm. And normally it will not take parental responsibility off one parent unless they are demonstrably terrible. Okay. Okay. But you've, if you've got your kids with you, you know you've been their main carer. You know there's nothing wrong with you. It's not going to happen to you. So don't worry about so that. So take that level of terror out, out. of your mindset. It's yes. not going to happen. So forget that if you can, because the well, legal people are saying know. it's not really going to happen. No. One doesn't know you're at, like fully. Yes. I, I mean, there are cases, right? But when you read them, you go, wow, that parent is next level. The children need to have a break. Mm, mm. Um, The kids just experience both sides as hurting them because they don't don't know how to believe, who to believe. You've got to say to your kids, look, that's mummy and daddy working that out. Mm -hmm. And uh, mummy and daddy love you very much. Yeah, and and it's not your fault. And we'll sort it out. Yeah. And, and otherwise, it's, um, I've seen them tell them the judge is going to decide and mm. they don't know who the judge is and they're worried about what the judge doesn't know what we're saying mm. and all of that. So, and, and a short, sharp letter to them telling them to stop it. Yeah. And you can use that information. As documentation. As documentation that they have been telling the kids about the court case. It's the hardest thing in the world not to respond mm. with no, that's not right. Mm. We're doing this. Oh, it's only an interim hearing tomorrow. Whatever. Don't. You'll have to. You can't. Right. So sadly, uh, we've only gotten through the first six examples and how they could apply to you after separation. We are going to do a second part episode where we're going to go into the other signs that you could see in separation coercive control, which is limiting your access to money. And we've talked about mm. how you can get over that hurdle. Reinforcing traditional gender roles. We can explore that a little bit and how that affects the family court system. Turning your kids against you, which is, you know, that mm. that whole parental alienation, uh, which which technically doesn't it's just exist, lying to your kids, yeah. uh, but lying to your kids. Uh, 10, controlling aspects of your health and your body. How does that continue after separation? Oh, well. uh, number 11, making jealous accusations. How does that occur after separation? How can you ignore that? And regulating your sexual relationship. Does that still occur after separation and what you can do about it? Mm. So, And we've got some examples of those things and, and what you can do about it. But mum, I think it's important that we just quickly touch Sean, I know I said I was going to. Yes. I just don't want to end it on on a downer <laughs> on a, on on that without giving you some tips. And I know we've given you some tips through. And I'd like it if you all took one thing from today, if you are experiencing separation abuse, if you are coming out of coercive controlling relationship, is there something that you could sit down and look at today? Even if it's just that, what names are they calling you? What are they trying to achieve by that? And, you know, writing down the opposite to, to reinforce yourself that who you are and you know You know what your name is and you know what you're capable of and you know who Mm. you are. Even if you write it in the third person. Yep. Like use your name. Yep. And and it's not like those general affirmations. It's specific. Yep. It's specific. Or do do a... um what do you call those bubble charts where you just... Mind map. Mind map. Do a mind map. You don't even have to write words. So you could do a Pinterest board. <laughs> you want to be visual. Um, uh, but so, but what I wanted to okay. talk about on the website Psychology Today, written by Julie Nee, an advocate and author, and she focuses on helping survivors of intimate partner violence heal. They had some suggestions, and I'm just going to list them out, but we're going to go in more detail in the next episode. So the steps that you can work on, and we'll put a link in the show notes, is write down your thought traps. So we talked about that, where, Mm. you know, gaslighters are really good at trying to push you to question your reality and doubt yourself. So write them down and write what, what you actually are so that you can remind yourself later on. Speak positively to yourself. That might be really Mm. hard to do, but that is a very good start. If you can start Mm. telling you, if you can notice those negative thoughts where you're your worst enemy in your head, start changing that narrative inside your head and start speaking to yourself like you would your mum or your children. Be compassionate to yourself. Yeah. Get connected. Find people who will believe you and support you. You know, get a good lawyer. Definitely go out there and find your support group because you cannot go through this alone. Mm. Okay. For those of you who are within our group, go onto the community support board, get them to give you some ideas. Mm. Uh, And then find a therapist. If you don't have a psychologist and you've been through coercive control, please find one. If you you can't afford one, there is a card in Australia where you can ring and they can try and hook you up with some free therapy sessions. Oh, okay. Go to your doctor, get a, um, a mental, mental health, health plan. care plan, yeah. and that'll be a little bit cheaper as well. And the court doesn't look down on that. Yeah. Uh, your ex might, yeah. but the court sees that 
as you appropriately dealing with the separation. Yes. Examine some of your acquired habits. Are you re- are you ready to stop doing some of the things the abuser is expected of you? Okay. Maybe the abuser mandated that you had to do a hot meal for dinner every single night. And if you would be all right with an easier dinner, sometimes now that's your choice. You don't have to cook dinner yeah. every night. Soup it is. Crackers, <laughs> crackers and cheese if you wanted yeah. to. So have a look at what what is it, what habits do you have that are ingrained in you from living with them for years and yeah. years? Are you making the bed perfect before you leave the room because they used to get mad at you? Are you making sure the, that, that the socks are ironed or the undies are ironed? Oh, you know, crazy. have a look at all your little movements and, and take some of those ones out that you don't care about and you were doing it for them and now you're separated, you can be Rephrase free. Rephrase it with your own, yeah. Yep. And build protective measures. So gaslighting often continues long after the relationship ends and that's mm. what we talked about, this post-separation abuse. And while it's not fully in your control, you can limit some of its effects by not looking at your text messages or emails from them after work hours are over, unless right. it, unless they've got the kids and it's an emergency. Yes, that's right. Creating a co-parenting chat um, app with you know our family wizard or our children, where you only then communicate with them on that. Set some boundaries up so that you're safe. Because the good thing about those is you can't delete. Yes. Yep. You can copy, but you can't. But you're also containing all the drama in a box and and giving yourself some space. That's right. You open that box on your terms and when you want to. And I don't think any communication laid on a Friday afternoon from a lawyer Mm -hmm. deserves to be read until the following Monday. No, I agree. (laughs) Generally. Generally. (laughs) This is obviously go see a lawyer before you change any legal processes after listening to this because because this is just education. This is not legal advice. That was just a generalisation. But really it's their agenda of urgency that you don't have to buy into. That's right. And lastly, avoid the self-blame cycle. Mm. So I know this is really going to be the hardest thing for anybody to do, but avoid that self-blame cycle, accept that none of this was your fault and believe it. Whoa, that's a big thing to believe. That's massive, isn't it? And and I don't think you need to say, oh, that was wasted 12 years, 10 years, 15 years. It wasn't. If you've got children... They wouldn't be there if you didn't have that relationship. Or if you don't have children, you wouldn't be the woman you are today or Mm -hmm. the man you are today if you hadn't gone through some of those experiences. And I think it will make you more compassionate and understanding Mm -hmm. and a better friend. And be compassionate with yourself because, again, Mm -hmm. all of this control is subtle and under underpinned under behaviors, Mm -hmm. looks, faces, and it takes years. It takes years to build this up. And it's going to take years to unbuild it. That look, the look that people can get from their ex, that can take them under all the good that's happened and take them straight back to eight years ago when they were in that relationship. And those people using those looks, we we get around that by not having people in the same room Mm -hmm. um, except in the trial. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, look, and the look is just a look. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they'll get wrinkles where they frown <laughs> and, and you don't have to react anymore. Yeah. So I want you all to try and think, you know, do you know what? Accept that none of this was your fault. It's not a high conflict divorce situation if you've got a post-separation legal abuser. Mm. It's not necessarily your fault. And the abuse that you suffered in your relationship, it's not your fault. If people say, why didn't you leave? They don't understand what it's like. Yeah. And so this is somebody else's behavior that has affected your relationship. They've made the choice to do these things and you are just coming out of it. So be kind to yourself and we will come back next week yeah. and we will have the other six signs. Yes. And mum, I would also like to point out that if anybody is struggling with this, you can ring mm-hmm. 1-800-RESPECT or you can ring Lifeline or you can, if you feel like you're in danger, ring triple zero. And of course, please go and get individual legal advice for all of these stages. But looking forward to continuing this discussion with you, Mum, and thank you to those who listen. And if you are listening and you're going through this, we are here for you. Hugs, Dars. All right. Keep thank you. Keep safe. Bye. Bye. If you found this podcast helpful, we'd love it if you could rate, review and subscribe. By doing so, you are spreading the word to help someone else just like you. Lynn would like to remind you that this podcast is general advice only and you should always get legal advice in relation to your particular situation. And remember that the Australian laws may have changed since recording.